on this episode of K-Pod. How has teaching techniques changed in Korea? Our best and worst teaching methods for learning English and how our teaching methods have changed over the years. All of this and a special guest here on K-Pod for this episode. We record our podcast in downtown Changwon City, South Korea, at the only Irish bar in town, O'Brien's Irish Bar and Restaurant. They are located in Juangdong, right across from the International Hotel on the third floor. If you're in the area, be sure to stop by and check them out for some great food, drinks, and one of the best atmospheres in the area. O'Brien's Irish Bar and Restaurant, Changwon City. It's K-Pod. Life in Korea with your hosts, Scott, Marco, and Adam. It's another episode of K-Pod, Life in Korea, the podcast that brings you some of the live stories and people living and working right here in South Korea. Once again, I'm one of the hosts, Scott. Sitting to my right is Adam. Adam, how's things? I'm great, thank you. And Marco. Marco, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty great, thanks. And got a special guest this week sitting right across from me. We've got Craig Nickel. Nickel, how's it going? Good, mate. It's been a long time. It has been indeed. So some people out there might know who Craig is. He used to live here in Changwon and was here for quite a long time. How long were you here for? I was here for about, I lived in Changwon for seven years over, I guess it was about a 13, well, 12 year period. So around seven years altogether. Yeah. Give, did, or, give or take. I did a year and a half in Busan as well. But yeah, so it was about eight and a half years living in Korea. And how long ago did you leave? Left in 2014. 14? Just to go to the World Cup in Brazil. So I left, yeah, March 2014. When was the uh, first time you came to Korea? Do you remember what year that was? I do. It was April Fool's Day, 2002. Uh, So just shortly after I came, actually, I think. Yep, that would be right. So you, you came here for the World Cup? I did. I yeah. did. I uh, was offered a job, uh, and I thought it was going to be just north of Seoul, and then they changed it at the last minute, and they said, can you go to a place called Changwon? I was like, where is that on the map? How many stadiums are nearby? And I figured it out. I could do Daegu, Ulsan, and Busan, and I was like, no problem, done. Did you go to any games in 2002? I did. I went to four different games. It started a bit of a lifelong obsession with myself going to World Cups. So in this episode, we're going to talk a little bit about how things have changed here in Korea in terms of uh, teaching since we all began teaching till now. We'll also get into uh, some of our best and worst teaching methods that we came across. And a little later, we're going to get into something that Craig's involved with now. Maybe one of the reasons he's returned for a little special visit. All right, so before we jump into uh, some of the things that have changed regarding teaching, at least teaching English in Korea here, Craig, so we found out you spent about seven years here. So where are you originally from? Uh, New Zealand. New Zealand. And was the World Cup the main reason that you decided to come to South Korea? No, it actually was uh, breaking up with a girl and uh, deciding it was time to go overseas. Um, Yeah, like it was, I mean, choosing Korea was to do with the World Cup, but I saw an advert in a newspaper and I was like, you know, jobs over in Korea teaching ESL. And I thought, appropriately enough, my worst subject at school was English. I thought I'd make a good English teacher, so... I thought, hey, answer this. And then I did a little T-cell course and then uh, was really keen to get out of New Zealand. I was terrible at saving money and someone could, you know, Korea offered free flights. So I was like, that's a good idea. Yeah, I remember that. Korea was also, you didn't need a university degree back then. For me, yeah, I, I did. I like when I, for the job that I applied for and to get my visa, it said you needed, uh, uh, at the time they said you needed a four-year degree and most of the degrees in New Zealand are three, but I had a um, TESOL certificate. So that kind of okay. took, took away the need for a four-year degree. Yeah, when uh, I remember I came here maybe just about a year before you and at that time, you didn't need a university degree you might have had to have a college diploma Mm -hmm. like in terms of uh, regarding canada anyway do you have difference in states like we have colleges and university there's a difference in canada uh we call everything college since i've come here i've started differentiating the generally like if it's there's community college and there's just college but that's basically the difference between new zealand 
usually call things universities and politics. Po- politics? Polytechs. Oh, politics. politics. P-O-L-Y. Po- Polytechnics. I thought uh, you said politics, too. I was like, hmm? Um, yeah, Polytechnics, um, which now people don't like that name, so they've all of a sudden, or oh, a lot of the Polytechnics have become institutes of technology. Are the, is that like a trade school? Kind of, yeah, but like a lot of them have uh, ventured out and uh, doing degrees and stuff now. So it used to be like a one-year certificate or a two-year diploma, but now some of them have ventured out and got three-year degrees, and some of them actually do master's master's programs now one of the places i worked at back home does that so yeah because in new zealand it's very hard for them to change to become a university like there's only eight universities in new zealand it's like a very kind of elite club i think uh for teaching in asia now the only country that uh, that allows people from community college or polytechs as you say are is cambodia i think every other country you you require they require you to have a four-year degree at what we'd say in canada university what you'd say in the states like I guess college not cu- not community college and what you'd say in new zealand university as well yeah. so uh craig you're still involved with the education system in some ways which we'll get get into in a little bit here so craig and i have probably been doing this the longest here at this table and adam's probably third you've been doing this about seven years here uh, uh not well here in in korea about eight years but uh, i've also taught in europe for a year so i'm about nine years in so. and marco's two years here yeah coming up on three coming up on three mm. so we got a little range here so what are some of the things that you found has changed since you started teaching english to now in terms of everybody's kind of changed jobs obviously mm-hmm. different work environments is there anything that is a uh, change regarding let's say your own methods or styles i think i think for me i think any anything in education uh there's a there's a little bit of an elitist attitude in, in terms of education and i think the a lot of if you look at a lot of other fields you know what degrees and stuff you have is not really that relevant but if you know you're looking for the better jobs and stuff there is still that uh, necessity to have a master's that master's has become the standard where it used to be something to uh, to attain, you know, something a high level to achieve. But now in the world where I work back home, like in universities and stuff, it's expected that you have a master's to to be at that level of teaching. Anything less is people kind of look down on you, I feel. Yeah, the definitely in Korea, qualifications for teachers has changed since I started here. I have uh, heard or read recently that there might be trying to get rid of teachers in public schools yeah. as far as foreigners because of the lack of experience and stuff regarding yeah. the teachers that some schools get. I was going to mention this actually uh, recently, the Korean Teachers and Education Workers Union, or abbreviated the K2U. Uh, in Seoul, they were saying that... Um, they wanted to phase out English teachers in elementary schools, basically because they thought that Korean English teachers could do the same job and that a lot of native teachers are underqualified. So, And which creates more work for the Korean teacher, I think. Right. But anyway, so qualifications have changed. Uh, obviously, the more that you teach, obviously you change yourself. So, Marco, is there anything that has changed regarding almost three years ago since you started teaching English? Different like, styles or methods that you use? And the way I teach, uh, yes, I have been very fortunate. I teach at a great school and teaching at the same school, teaching the same ages. I'm teaching the same classes again and again, and I get to try different things uh, every time I go over the same unit. Uh, And a lot of things, I mean, I guess I'm still relatively new at teaching. But um, honestly, what's changed the most for me is classroom management. Okay. So Um, controlling the kids? I don't like the word control. (laughs) But yeah, basically. I do. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, when I started, I just kind of was, I started in the middle of the year and I was trying to follow in the footsteps of the teacher before me because he was very well liked. And I understand why he had a very positive attitude and he was very handsome and in Korea, that's a big deal. And uh, he was a a very good teacher. So I was just... What school was it? uh, I teach at Poly. Uh, It's just, okay, it wasn't me then. I thought you were talking about me. (laughs) 
But yeah. yeah, so I was trying to follow in his footsteps. So I guess the word control does fit taking control of the classroom, like taking my own control instead of just teaching the way someone else did and following the rules that they laid out. Um, I have tried my own methods of management. Some have worked, some have not. But, you know, when that happens, you just keep searching for new methods. And Adam, what's the biggest difference for you? Uh, well, I think for me, teaching in a public school for all these years, um, I've been just trying to focus on getting more student fo- student-centered student activities in the classroom instead of just like a teacher standing there, which is kind of like the Korean traditional style where, you know, there's a lecturer and students just sit there and passively take notes. I try to get the students to actually interact with each other, practice the key expressions with one another. Um, and also, I've noticed that like a lot of these textbooks that I work with, they try to incorporate some kind of like cultural uh, element to it, where and like the the students see like oh this is how they do this here and this is how it's different from what we do things here and I think that's just meant to kind of like broaden their minds like you know there's a lot there's a big world out there uh, and people do things differently so all right and Craig when's the last time you were in a classroom uh, about three weeks ago oh really um, yeah I just did a short term contract in uh, China oh yeah that's right I did uh, two years uh, teaching at a school that was in China a polytech that was affiliated with our school back in New Zealand so we used to be the coordinator there now I just went back to do a, a contract to help them out in between my chasing time English stuff so it was uh, yeah it was good to get back into the classroom from compared to teaching back home like I've done a couple of years teaching in New Zealand a couple of years teaching in China it's very different you know like there's a huge difference between EFL and ESL I love teaching ESL back in New Zealand it's you know half the job's taking care of for you because you've got a classroom full of multicultural students that have to speak to each other in English yep. and that's such a big thing trying to do that in Asia trying to get Korean kids to speak to each other in English or trying to get Chinese kids to speak to each other in English it's it's a huge challenge for any of us but you know that that's taking care of you for you in ESL back home and you know you've also got the outside environment with a living and experiencing it every day and I, I find the ESLs a lot more enjoyable but you know I, like, I do like the challenges at EFL so going back to China it was it's a challenge because the, the students that we had their level was not great and the classroom sizes it got bigger so classroom management becomes a bigger challenge and Chinese students are absolutely addicted to their phones which which is obviously one of the downsides of technology that's coming through at the moment and it's something that we're going to have to adapt to do they confiscate the phones in the classroom or um it's like the school didn't put out a policy on that and like there's some schools that do and some schools that don't and you know like if you're going to do it it's got to be all across the board yeah but in um in the school we were in they didn't so it's a challenge in itself yeah that's got to be a headache man because like if my kids had access to their phones they take them there's like a special cupboard for them but if if my kids had access to the phones i'd be going crazy you know like because they're always going to be pulling them out probably like under the desk kind of thing you know like like as you used to like write notes to your friends back in the day you know and I have some kids who like will pull out their phones in class, but uh, usually I will take it if they're using it during class. But if they're not, it doesn't bother me if they have it. I don't even care if they have it sitting on the table. I can see it if I can see that they're not using it because maybe they're just checking the time because I actually in my classrooms have all the clocks turned off because th- that way kids are not staring at the clock all the time. And with the older kids, the ones who have the phones, it doesn't bother me as much. It's the younger kids. I don't want to know the time. So if they're not like on their phone, we don't have clocks in our school. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Do you use computers? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I turned the clock off of my computer ah, as well. Like even in the bottom right corner? Yep. Oh, I didn't even realize you could do that. Just going back to that, like, I mean, as I was saying, like with bigger classrooms, it's, it's certainly harder to control that. And it's like when you've got more than 30 kids in a class, it makes it very challenging to control that situation when there's no policy enforced. And it makes it frustrating at the same time. And when you've got low-level students that don't have much of an interest in English anyway, it just adds to the, the, the troubles that you face as 
as a teacher in those situations. So anyway, technology is uh, making changes to how people study and learn things, obviously, like all this talk with cell phones and classrooms. Is there any difference, say, I'll ask Adam, Adam, since you started, whatever, seven or eight years ago, do you use technology in any ways? I have to because my textbooks have uh, CDs and I have well, smart CDs. Or- yeah, but I mean, like uh, <laughs> CDs that align with the with the lessons. And so like the, the things like listen and repeat activities, I have to put them into the computer and I have to use like a smart TV in my classroom. So without those, I mean, I could teach without the technology, but I think... Oh, you mean like a DVD with... DVD with with various video with video clips and, and stuff I like that. I thought you just meant like a CD. Well, yeah, well, yeah. I guess it would be like a DVD, but yeah, it's like it's like uh, it's a CD slash DVD that has listen and repeat clips where you know you kind of like try to ask them comprehension questions and then there's also like some of my textbooks are really good like they have like some interactive games where you can kind of review the material is it just audio though no it's all it's video and audio yeah marco do you use any type of technology in your classrooms yeah my school use a lot of technology actually like he said there were some that have the the audio that come with the books uh although recent like this year we've been getting a lot of it digitally like in our teachers resources we can just get mp3s instead of having to deal with cds um and then i have powerpoints that uh, help the kids like follow through the lessons it'll have pages from the book which is nice because then i can point exactly where they need to look in the book and then on their own we have uh something called epoly and the kids can go on and they review and play like games and study on their own there are like songs uh like an entire computer program just like for our kids to do to practice at home Mm -hmm. yeah there's another website Site, I think that's well known in Korea. EBS. I'm sure you guys have heard it before. They they have a radio station and a website and everything. So. So, Craig, you're into some new technology in the classroom and what people can do to help learn English, but you're on a different end of it this time. So what exactly are you into? Um, well, I went back home and uh, it's it's a different world teaching back there. But um, what we've got into is uh, called uh, Chasing Time English. And we're a newly established company. And our primary goal is to provide dramas for English language learners with original content developed by ELT professionals. It can be either used in the classroom or for independent learners or together for flipped classrooms. We've released uh, Fortune as our two independent series. One set at a pre-intermediate level and one is an upper intermediate level at the end of uh, 2017. And we released Adrift, our next series, which is uh, advanced level uh, in August last year. And we just finished this weekend filming uh, Skipper's Pass, which is our set for the intermediate level so later this year we're going to have a digital platform of shows which we will look at to sell to universities colleges polytechnics and language institutes so this is basically uh i watched season one of fortune so it's basically like a a movie that uh students can watch with obviously material to go along with it and it's in different segments is that correct that's right so each episode i would say not movies so much but uh, well yeah yeah Six uh, part episodes, or we and the episodes are about six minutes long because we don't want to make it to put too much stress on the students to watch something for too long. You know, like we want to engage them for a short period of time, short and concise, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you're looking at um, providing enough material, so everything has been developed for length second language learners. It's not like a lot of shows that people have used like Friends and stuff like that, and tried to go back and make materials for things like that but what we're trying to do here is looking at from the other way everything's developed for second language learners right from the start whereas something like friends is for first language learners sorry first language speakers and it's, it's appropriate that we every word that's used in there is for a learning purpose and how exactly did you get involved with Chasing Time? Um, a couple of uh, my friends from New Zealand uh, had been making uh, short films, uh, Scott Granville and uh, Ben Woolen. And Ben's been doing a lot of filming for a long time. Uh, he's done some stuff with Peter Jackson on the recent Mortal Engines that's coming out. So he, he's, he knows his stuff. And uh, Scott and him had been doing a lot of short films and they'd had quite a bit of success going to festivals around America. 
America, but Scott had always been in the um, English education industry and he wanted to do something different. And we always thought that there was a lack of authentic listening material out there. And we wanted to make something that was engaging for students. And this is what we've come up with. Yeah, Scott was a teacher here too, right? That's right. I knew Scott when he uh, lived here, obviously. Yeah, we uh, found out that we'd played against each other when we were 14 years old in a football match. Uh, we were sitting at the bar having a conversation and like, did you play for that school? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, I, I played for that school. And yeah, we've been friends ever since. Small so world, much. man. A uh, very small world. There's, there's a thing in New Zealand where they say there's three degrees of separation. And then if you go to university, there's two. Like... It's not this uh, Kevin Bacon six degrees of separation in New Zealand. So getting back to Chase and Time English. So when you went back home after what what, what World Cup was it? South Africa? No, it was left. after Brazil. I went back and I uh, went back home for a month. Then I travelled around uh, North America and then South America for the World Cup. Went back to North America and then finally went back home and uh, got a job uh, teaching in. Uh, Wintech in New Zealand, uh, which is uh, Institute of Technology, but they've got a very good uh, English language center. So I was um, working with my friend Scott. Again. So Scott and Ben were both in New Zealand at the time? That's right. So you guys got together and talked about it. How'd you come up with, uh, let's say, I, like I said, I watched Fortune. How'd you come up with the story? It's uh, all Scott and Ben. Like yeah. I, I actually went overseas for a while and... Uh, for the school I was working in China and Scott was sending me messages about it when he was over there but him and Ben came up with Fortune and they were just talking about it on the way to the airport one day about how they could do this how that they could turn something that we'd always thought about you know how how that they could turn their great ideas of short films into something that was productive for language learning and uh, Fortune's what they came up with Scott's I mean got plenty of ideas he's got great, uh, great set of scripts already written for all our future series he's already got two and three already written out and a few more on the way he loves coming up with these ideas and he's great at it you know so just to be clear for people listening it's kind of like uh almost like a, a netflix series but uh shorter obviously like you said six seven minutes an episode which involves using certain english language phrases and stuff that you kind of have exercises that you can use after watching an episode right i mean there's there's elements of all language learning in there like um so the idea in the future with our digital platform comes out um, later this year is that you'll be able to go and select what level you want so whether you want beginner elementary pre-intermediate intermediate upper intermediate advanced You'll have different shows at each level that you can choose. And all the materials are prepared there for it. So the materials are either self-study or the, for a teacher in class to use as a communicative tool. So speaking of class, I was going to ask you, do you think the system is for being used in a classroom or more for individual study at home or both? Both. Absolutely both. both. Um, I think it's one of those things where if you've got motivated students that, that want to do it by themselves, you know, the, there's a lot of self-study material out there. I mean, this is what we're trying to do is have something that's engaging, that keeps their attention. And a lot of the stuff is set up for them to do by themselves. Or a teacher can use it in class as a, you know, as I said, as a, a communicative tool, um, both yeah, a very suitable. Um, is it like one of those programs where you purchase, like you can purchase for business or you can purchase for home? Uh, do you, are, when you sign up or you purchase this, are you signing up as a self-study or for a classroom? How does that work? Currently, you can buy it in a PDF form. Uh, you can go to our website and you can purchase. You can purchase as a student, as a teacher. Later on, when we our digital platform is developed, uh, which should be in the next few months, it's going to be available hopefully on uh, Articulate Storyline, which can be put on as a Moodle on any kind of Moodle platform around universities, schools, and institutes will be the main focus of who we're selling it to. But individuals will be able to buy it as well. But at the in its current form, individuals can buy it. Uh, the PDFs that have all the teaching and learning materials on them and that are available. Yeah, it's good to go digital these days, eh? Like, uh, it, it's it's easier for the consumer and, you know, the person who's selling the, the materials, right? Like, 
and we're saving trees, I guess. But we're like, definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll actually, we actually have a publisher as well. So, I mean, some people still prefer to use books. So, we've got an American publisher, uh, Alphabet Publishing, and they've published our first series, Fortune, uh, in both the Blue and the Gold series, which are two different levels. And we've also got Adrift, our next series, that are just about to start publishing them very soon. So, there's still people out there that like the book and they want the book in their classroom so there's that option or the you know i really like how you have it separated into uh divisions too like um like you said like beginner lower intermediate intermediate upper intermediate and advanced and so on because like though that really does make a difference if somebody has no exposure to uh you know english conversation you know you, you then you obviously have to say you know start off with a beginner but if somebody's like you know i've studied a little bit but i don't really know that much then you maybe recommend like a lower intermediate I mean, it, it, it really does depend with these levels, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You know, like somebody who had studied abroad, but only briefly, you'd be like, well, maybe stop, start with like upper intermediate and then work your way up to advanced, you know? Yeah, it's just finding out where, where your English ability is at at the time. And it just once you've got that, then you can move ahead, you know, trial something. You might find it's a bit easy, then step up to the next level or vice versa. If something's a bit hard, yeah, step down to the, the level that's below. Yeah, because you don't want somebody getting into like upper intermediate when their when their language skills are quite low because right. they're going to feel too overwhelmed you know absolutely yeah. so that's that's part of the idea is to have a whole range at each level and we'll just keep adding more shows every year now you have different levels do you also is it geared for different ages as well at the moment we're focusing on uh high school and adults um there is talk of going into the children's market later on, but it's a completely different market. And what you're looking at with TV shows for children is completely different from what you're looking at for adults. So it's something that we'll look at in the future. Uh, the children's market is, is a massive market in itself, but at the moment our focus is on uh, adult learners or high school learners, yeah. teenagers. I watched was it season one, Fortune, and I would say in Korea... I would say middle school and up could watch that. I mean, there's nothing... Right. With the, the, little little tinge of violence maybe here and there. Not really, though, you know what I mean? Not compared to what kids watch. But uh, it's also... Younger kids, obviously, it's all about attention span and stuff like that. Like, obviously, animated stuff like that would be... And with other technology, attention spans are growing short. Shorter and shorter and shorter. Absolutely agree about that. Like the, the attention span is brutally <laughs> short these days. Yeah. So you got to you got to engage them for as long as you can. And as you say, Scott, like it, there's nothing in there that's offensive. Uh, there's nothing that you know. There's no bad language. There's no real violence. There's nothing that's going to upset no. anyone or cross any cultural backgrounds or anything like that. That's offensive. Do you also provide, like, a lot of, like, everyday English expressions or idioms that people, like, uh, are not familiar with? So, when you look at the materials, you know, there's a little bit of a grammar focus, which we've also got grammar videos mm -hmm. to support it with. We've also got situational videos. I've that, seen those with Scott, right? I've right. seen Scott in a few videos, anyway. Yeah. So, there's, like, the the materials are broken into different sections, mm -hmm. and you've got your, your grammar focus, you've got your vocab focus, uh, you've got your your um, situational questions, your pragmatic stuff, and then you've got your extension activities. Okay. So, like, I mean, a lot of people get upset about grammar being taught. You know, there's, there's the big argument where, you know, whether you know, grammar needs to be taught or whether it doesn't, you know. It's, it's a necessary it's, evil, though. Yeah, there, no? there's, I, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Like, and there, there's, like, if you do go into the research and do your, your masters and that, that's the big argument, you know, the input versus the output ideas. Yeah. Um, but I think these these things are necessary to, to put a little bit of grammar in there. You're not overdoing it, but you've got the vocab in there that they need. The, the main stuff is the, the pragmatic stuff, the situational mm. use of the language. And we've compiled a lot of uh, on our YouTube channel, which is obviously freely available for you to subscribe it, where you can watch our grammar videos, you can watch our situational and pragmatic stuff, and you can also usually view our trailers and we might put a uh, first episode of a series up there so you get a sneak preview of what it's about. Mm. But is Fortune still up on there for people to for the first two first. first two episodes of Fortune? Okay. But if you want to 
go to our website, you can view it through there. But uh, on YouTube, you've got uh, Fortune One, Episode One, uh, sorry, Fortune Blue, Episode One, Fortune Gold, Episode One and Two. So you can have a sneak peek at that. If you're curious about it and you want to see what the materials, you can still download the first episode materials for Fortune Gold One or Fortune Blue. So Blue is at a pre-intermediate level and Gold is at a uh, upper intermediate level. That's at the website? Yes. So just go to the website, which is... ChasingTimeEnglish.com. That's right. And YouTube. YouTube's just... Chasing Time English. Just chuck in Chasing Time English and they'll take you there. And, you know, do what everyone does. Like, subscribe, and comment. Yeah. You can find out more about Chasing Time English, obviously, at the, probably everything at your website, right? Absolutely. So, ChasingTimeEnglish.com. That's right. And, you know, like, obviously, you can follow us on our Facebook group and... Like everyone else, we've got the Twitter following and uh, we're, we're just getting sorted out on LinkedIn and Instagram as well. So there's many different avenues that you can follow us. I'd say the Facebook group is where we keep everyone up to date with what's happening. Okay. And that's, again, Chasing Time English that's on right. Facebook. Yeah, that's a highly acclaimed, you know, like service. You were telling me you guys won an award in, in England or something uh, recently? Did, didn't win. We uh, got nominated to the finals. Uh, well, that's good uh, enough. So, though. yeah, like uh, it was, it came out of the blue. It was uh, very nice. It was um, from, there's a big uh, educational magazine called the, the Pie News, which is across um, the whole education field. And we got nominated, uh, we're a nominated finalist in the section of uh, digital innovation of the year last yeah. year for learning so that gave us a lot that's of exposure. great man that, yeah like that that's got to give you a lot of like motivation to kind of continue it further and absolutely yeah you know, like it's it sees this little bit of feedback along the way you know we've got lots of good feedback from a lot of people into the industry but yeah like getting that recognition was was great yeah and, you know gave us a lot of confidence in what we're doing and that sure. we're on the right path yeah like they saw something in it you know like that that's worthwhile kind of thing you know so that's good man yeah thanks yeah no it was it was where everyone was really chuffed when we got nominated for that obviously a little gutted that we didn't win but you know such uh, as must life. be honored <laughs> to be nominated at least though, sure, you know sure like i mean you're not going to complain about getting invited to a big prize given in london all right so craig so what's your role in all this well i'm the uh business relationship manager for uh, chasing time english so what we're looking at doing is we're setting up agents uh, around the world in each country to look at distributing chasing time english products to various schools and institutes around their country so at the moment i'm visiting uh korea and having discussions with some people also heading to japan next going through hiroshima and uh, osaka kyoto and then up to tokyo and got a couple of uh, meetings to try and sort out so it sounds like a lot of a lot of countries have invested some interest in this yeah like words getting out there about what we're doing and it's it's starting to pick up and a lot of people are getting back to us and wanting to represent us and are interested in uh, being agents for us so it's just going through and setting up a, a distribution system that that'll work for the future of it once the digital platform rolls out mm, that's great man so you know onwards and upwards then indeed, indeed definitely yeah that's great that's good news so once again for people that want to access any information you can go to chasingtimeenglish.com correct that's right check them out on uh, youtube too I, I watch a lot of their stuff on youtube and i'd highly recommend it i enjoyed fortune Thanks. season one i think i, I yeah watched watched all six episodes is six. that's right you should uh make sure you get to watch uh, adrift is there any episodes of that on youtube now or uh the trailer's on there and the Trailer. first first episode of uh, adrift is also available on there but if you want to see the other uh episodes in the series you just go to chasingtimeenglish.com and just sign up uh it's a free membership and you'll be able to access the videos all right i plan on doing that like again i, I really enjoyed for so not in any no offense not in any educational way but i enjoyed watching the mini series let's call it yeah my father did the same thing he was intrigued by the whole thing uh and i didn't even show him the um the educational stuff but yeah like it's it'll catch your attention and the fact that it's a, a learning tool as well is, is massive um so if it's used properly i think it can be extremely effective but uh if once once this is put up i'll, I'll put up all the details where you can follow uh chasing time english underneath the comments we'll have all the links 
with the podcast for everything. Awesome. So you can check that out at ChasingTimeEnglish.com. Checking out, check them out on YouTube and all social media. Everything's probably Chasing Time English. That's right. And if you have any comments or any thoughts or questions, you can leave your comments below. Don't forget to like and share this episode of the podcast. And check us out on Chang Wanner on Facebook, YouTube, iTunes. Like and follow us on iTunes. That always helps. And once again, I'm Scott. You can find me at scott at changwander.com or anything changwonderful.com is fine too. And Marco, where can people get in touch with you? I am on Facebook. I am also on Instagram, just Marco Baia, B-A-I-L-L-E. And you can also find me at kpop.global. And Adam, where can people get in touch with you? Adam Maxwell Kent on Facebook and Ever Stalwart on Instagram. And I'd like to thank our guest, Craig, for stopping by and doing this. Where can people get in touch with you? Well, if they want to get in touch with uh, Chasing Time English, they're welcome to join our Facebook page. And any messages that you send through there, I'll be able to uh, communicate with you. If you want to follow what we're doing or follow me personally on LinkedIn, um, just look for Craig Nickel, which uh, C-R-A-I-G-N-I-C-O-L. And you can just follow me also on Facebook, just under the same name. But yeah, thanks very much guys for having me here today it was a privilege thanks for being here man it's great yeah Yeah, it's great to learn about this uh this new program that you're promoting and everything it's it's, it's, yeah it's wonderful yeah cheers um yeah like it's great to have uh, old friends to come out and help out and uh give a bit of a shout out to what we're doing all right so that was craig nickel and chase of time english and thanks for tuning in and we'll see you again soon We record our podcast in downtown Changwon City, South Korea at the only Irish bar in town, O'Brien's Irish Bar and Restaurant. They are located in Jungang-dong, right across from the International Hotel on the third floor. If you are in the area, be sure to stop by and check them out for some good food, drinks, and one of the best atmospheres in the area. O'Brien's Irish Bar and Restaurant, Changwon City.